Hello, everyone. Very good afternoon to you. So this is uh, one of the last series for the webinar on the challenges and opportunities for corporate social responsibility in a time of crisis. Let me start by introducing myself. And I'm Dr. Zhang from Business School. Uh, my current research and the teaching interests uh, focus on impact investing, sustainability, and uh, corporate social responsibility. And that's what I would like to share with you about what would happen after the pandemic and what is the impact on corporate social responsibility. So let me start sharing with uh, my screen with you right now. All of us understood that uh, we are in the midst of a very unusual crisis. So what happened to many of us is that we incur very unusual activities, such as we are staying at home and working from home, and the students have to uh, do the home-based learning. So today I'm going to focus about the implications for the corporate uh, in the midst of crisis like this. So let me start with a little bit of review of what happened in the past. The corporate social responsibility traditionally have been considered by the finance uh, industry such that it is a basically a bottom line uh, consideration. So the corporates usually would consider how they are going to generate revenue and then they are trying to focus on minimizing the cost such that they, they could maximize the profits that they are generating. So as they consider this kind of uh, profit maximization and the distribution of the uh, residual value to shareholders, they are also taking care of other stakeholders along the way. Therefore, under this kind of shareholder theory, the CSR is basically the bottom line activity. It does not have to require additional attention from the corporates. But this view has been changed more recently under the stakeholder theory. The stakeholder theory has been proposed by Freeman in 1984. So this theory basically says that firm does not operate in isolation. It has impact to various stakeholders that it will interact in the process of business activities. So therefore, what the firm does to these stakeholders are going to affect how the firms are also generating the profits. And this relationship is much more convoluted compared to the relationship under the shareholder theory. Let me give you an example. Let's say you want to take care of the uh, employees' welfare. So from the traditional shareholders' view, it will basically increase the cost. Nevertheless, under the stakeholder theory, such care for the employees could also potentially generate a lot more revenues for working harder with the customers and also could save the cost with the suppliers because the employees are more motivated to work for the firm. Therefore, such interconnected relationship will be taken into account when firms are conducting corporate social responsibility. But because of this complicated relation, it is actually hard to pinpoint how much each of the CSR activity can help to generate additional value for the firm. Unless you are running a controlled experiment, for example, in a lab setting, you control everything else as constant while you change one of the parameter, let's say employees' welfare, and then you look at how, what is the impact on the bottom line of the firm. Of course, this kind of ideal experiment is not possible in a natural setting, even though that some researchers have taken such an extent to conduct a natural experiment by setting up a real firm and then focusing on the CSR aspect. And they found out that the good CSR firm is able to save about 25% of the cost by hiring the best employees available in the labor market. But because that in the real world, such experiment is very difficult to conduct. And therefore we see a significant increase of the research interest in the relationship between the CSR and firm performance. 
So in this picture, you can see that in the most recent two decades, there are about 1.8 million research articles that have been starting to focus on the relationship between the company's social activities and the firm performance. While the research interest looking at business and the society relationship has been declining. So this shows that people are becoming more and more interested in understanding how the corporate social responsibility could play a more important role in affecting firm performance. And besides the research interests, there are also a lot of government activities and the uh, regulation have been imposed in recent years. Give you one example in Singapore, the government has implemented the sustainability reporting for all the public listed firms starting from 2016. And in 2019, the government has also started to implement green carbon tax. So this forced the corporates to respond to this kind of consideration that what they do will actually be leading to further cost and the consideration of the revenue generation. So in addition, we have also seen that the investor community are also becoming more and more interested in investing into firms that are becoming more socially responsible. So just to give you an illustration about the recent trend in Singapore domain, UN is referring to United Nations, PRI refers to principal responsible investors. So this kind of voluntary, uh, you know, um, form of organizations basically um, try to encourage all the institutional investors to make responsible investment. So when they are putting the money into certain firms, they have to consider the social and the environment aspect of the corporates that they are investing in. So even though that we are going through pandemic in last six months in Singapore, you can see that the number of signatories from Singapore institutional investors continue to increase. Okay, so this review the investors interest in looking into firms that are engaging more and more socially responsible activities. Now I would like to explain two recent trends that have been discovered through the academic research. The first trend comes from the study of the introduction of sustainability ratings by Morningstar. So in 2016, when Morningstar introduced the ratings for all the firms that under their coverage, the researcher found out that after the introduction of these ratings, they see the change of the investor flow for the uh, most positive rated firms. So there is an increase on the upper trend. And this represents about 0.3% per month and 4% per year. Okay, so this is the uh, after the introduction of the sustainable uh, ratings. And on the other hand, when the firms are receiving very negative ratings, they see that institutional investors are fleeing away from these type of firms. So this gives us an important understanding that the firms can no longer ignore their sustainability and uh, social responsible actions anymore because investors, especially institutional investors, do start to react towards such kind of uh, performance. But on the other hand, I also want to bring you to attention of another recent study that are looking at the relationship between the socially responsible investment and the uh, mispricing of the underlying portfolios. So this research is still a working paper and therefore I put a question mark here because the results still need to be uh, continuously uh, validated. But let me just give you a glimpse of the preview of the results. So basically the researchers divided all the firms into uh, five decile and grouped them into the low ESG means uh, a company with a low 
socially responsible ratings. And then they also group them into the median range as well as the high range of the uh, corporate social responsibility ratings. So it turns out that when the firms receive a very low ESG ratings, they are also subjected to a very significant uh, underprice uh, abnormal return. And this amounts to about 0.47% per month. Okay, so in another words, that these firms are actually attractive from the mispricing perspective. So on the other side of this graph, you can see that for the high ESG uh, firms, they actually experience a high level of overpricing. That means many investors are buying these uh, good firms and therefore they are exposed to uh, overpricing uh, phenomena. So this gives us an indication that we cannot just by simply focusing on the ESG rating itself, okay, we should also take consideration of other aspects of asset pricing. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the additional finding from the paper, because when they zoom into this group of institutional investors, they found that the mispricing are most observed in those funds that are financially constrained. Okay, so if the, if the funds are not financially constrained and they do not observe very significant mispricing in the portfolios that they are holding. So that's the comforting news. Now I'm going to introduce an interesting new concept that focus on um, a very sustainable economy. And this sustainable economy is going to consist of five types of capitals. So what I'm going to focus on today is basically social capital, but I will quickly go through the other four types of capital as well. Financial capital refers to, you know, the financial assets such as uh, uh, stocks and credits and uh, the savings of the economy. While human capital we understand is the skill level and the knowledge level and the innovative level of the workforce. The produced capital include all those uh, things that um, we have uh, constructed, for example, infrastructure, transportation, okay, and uh, the goods and the services that we produce in the economy. That refers to the produced capital. And natural capital refers to the natural endowment of, uh, let's say, air and uh, water, uh, and uh, also the, uh, you know, the quality of the soil and the forest that, you know, has been uh, endowed within the country. So these four types of capitals are usually uh, discussed frequently in economic studies. But what I'm going to focus on today is the idea of social capital. So what is social capital? Let me give you an illustration. Social capital have many different definitions, but today I'm going to give you one of the most straightforward definition. It basically refers to the norms, values, and trust, as well as the network among the individuals within an organization or within a society. That this kind of uh, set of characteristics would allow people to work together in a coordinated way, such that they can achieve a common good. Okay, so this is the definition of social capital. So what is that social capital has to do with uh, corporate social responsibility that I have discussed so far? Let me give you a broader version of the social capital when we are considering the corporate social responsibility. Social capital can also be valued within the for-profit firms, which are the firms that I have talked so far. So within a firm, social capital can be defined, for example, as the morale, loyalty, pride, happiness, and the purpose of the employees. So these are all understood the concept before, but now we are going to label them as social capital within the firm. And outside of the firm, social capital can be considered as the network and the trust with different stakeholders, for example, suppliers and the customers. And then at the societal level, social capital can also be considered as the identity of the citizens 
the community and collaboration among the public and coordination in their activities. So social capital is no longer considered as a static concept because it can be continuously increased or decreased given the consistent actions and the unambiguous signals to the people outside. Okay, so now I'm going to link more explicitly between the corporate social responsibility and the social capital that I have just defined. So the social capital within the firm will focus on the stakeholders such as employees, managers, and their family members. And when a firm start to engage on corporate social responsibility, it will help the employees to boost their morale, loyalty, pride, purpose, and happiness. Okay, so various studies have shown that this would be the effect. For example, employees working on very socially responsible firms, they are much happier than the, the, when they work for other types of firms. And through the corporate donations and the volunteering activities, it will also help to boost the morale and altruism motivation within the employees. Because after all, we are all human beings and we do have that altruism instinct within each one of us. And when we find that when we are working in an organization which also allow us to donate and volunteer, then we are more likely to stay with the company because it gives us an additional sense of purpose in the society. Now let's move on to the social capital that can be generated outside of the firm when the CSR activities are engaged. So through the, uh, the CSR activities, corporate donation can actually boost the company image. And it will also bring the awareness of the brand names to the customers. And then the suppliers, knowing that a company are doing a lot of activities for social purposes, they will also be willing to participate and build up more trust uh, and provide more businesses with this firm. And now let's look at the social capital at a societal level, okay? The stakeholders involved here will be the general public and also the government agencies. So it will also help the corporate to boost the image in the eyes of the public or potential customers. These are the people who have not purchased the products from the company before, but now when they heard about the good things that companies are doing in the midst of the crisis, then they will also become potentially interested in buying their goods and services. And the government can also use the donate the cash, goods and the manpower without incurring additional budget expense to cope with the crisis. And this will promote a very good sense of uh, responsible citizenship and build the social trust with one another, confidence in the society and in various sectors in the, uh, for example, the government as well as the private sectors. And it can also foster the innovativeness uh, in the economy. Okay, so this is basically the explanation how the corporate social responsibility can be related to the increase of the social capital in the midst of the crisis. Now I'm going to give you two research ideas that has been kind of revealing such kind of evidence. Okay, we do not have the direct research that has linked all these uh, CSR to the increased level of the social capital, but that is an interesting future research topic. What I'm going to explain to you right now is something that has already been done, but it gives us the indication about uh, what is the relationship that I have just talked about. Okay, so this research basically focuses on a one specific types of companies. So when the companies are rated with uh, the ESG rating, okay, they are either considered good firms or bad firms. But there are also firms that are considered as uh, uh, great firms because they have some good aspects, but they also have some bad aspects, okay? So these are the uh, great firms that we call them. And it turns out that the market find is rather confusing to price this kind of uh, gray firms. So let me give you the evidence of what the market think about such firms. So the gray firms, okay, when it compare with the, the pricing with the good firms or the neutral firms, neutral firms means they are neither good nor bad, or versus the bad firms. Okay, so these are the 
results that has been conducted. Okay, so if we focus on the Russell 1000 firms, you can see that the great firms have been significantly underpriced with respect to all the other three groups of firms. If you enlarge the sample to 3000 firms, okay, under the Russell index, then you can see that the mispricing is still quite significant. What about those firms that are usually attract a large amount of institutional investors, such as S&P 500 firms? We still observe that the gray firms are underpriced relative to the neutral firms as well as the bad firms. So this gives us an indication that the link between the CSR and social capital might not be in a linear way. And therefore the market find it's hard when the firms are doing different activities related to CSR. Okay, when they are doing something good at the same time where they're also doing something bad. So there will be increase and the reduction of the social capital. And this would give us, you know, more space to think about how we can tackle such complicated relationship. I also want to highlight another study, a recent study that have been focusing on the return and the CSR during a specific crisis. So this paper has been focusing on the recent financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And they found out that for the firms that are doing very well in CSR, they are able to generate 4.8% of return in the raw return measure and 8.7% after they control for all the other risk factors. When they reconstruct the CSR measure by using the core power measure, okay, they found that the firms that are doing extremely well in the top quartile is able to generate 4.53% in terms of the raw return and 7.27% in the abnormal return. When they take the study to a different setting, such as the Enron and WorldCom fraud crisis, they also found that the firms that are good, okay, are able to generate additional raw return, 7.3 to 9.5% of the abnormal return. But unfortunately, when they try to see that whether this kind of uh, valuation uh, impact can be carried on after the crisis, they didn't find such evidence they found that most of the positive returns are mainly rewarded during the crisis. And once the firm or the, the, the economy is out of the crisis, uh, such positive uh, CSR performance seem not to be appreciated that much by the market, okay? So this is something that we need to think about how to continue you know, the positive valuation of the firm by the market. The good thing is that when the researcher looking into how this CSR has actually come about in affecting the firm performance, they found out that the impact, the positive impact are usually on the operating activities. So the operating uh, return on assets, gross margin, sales growth have all been increased. And the blue bar shows the impact during the crisis and the red bar shows the impact after the crisis. So the good thing here that we observe is that the CSR activities continue to have positive uh, impact on the firm performance during as well as after the crisis. And just now we talked about briefly about the employees morale. It also shows that the good CSR companies is able to generate more sales per employee. And this shows that employees are becoming more productive. All right, so maybe they are more motivated, they have high morale and they have, uh, uh, you know, the pride in continuing working for the company during the crisis because these companies are doing socially responsible activities. So now I'm going to give you an illustration about how the CSR is related to the social capital in the current pandemic uh, period. So some of the CSR activities that we observe, uh, including directly related to the business activities, fund companies are keeping the price unchanged or they can even lower the price because the demand is very high, but they do not want to take advantage of the high increased demand. So the sample firms that we observe here, including NTUC Income and Shinsong, 
and just a couple of days ago, our ministers have actually, you know, uh, really uh, praised, you know, some of these uh, local firms for staying strong and by providing, you know, the stable goods and services during the, uh, the pandemic. So such activities is going to help to boost the loyalty and the morality of the employees within the firm. It also increased the brand image and the network among the uh, external uh, uh, stakeholders. And at the societal level, they can also keep the public calm and build up the trust, okay? And for the donations that are given by the corporates, okay, they also increase their employees' pride and sense of community. Because when you give as a corporate, instead of giving as an individual, you feel very different, okay? I have personally uh, experienced the differences when I contributed, you know, into my organization when we are giving, you know, the donations to the needed party. And then for the external stakeholders, there's an increase of reputation. And at the societal level, there's a giving uh, culture that has been built up. And volunteerism is giving basically similar kind of social capital at the three different levels. It will also help the society to have built up a volunteering culture. More importantly, I want to mention is about the innovation that we observe through the CSR activities. We see that during the pandemic, a lot of uh, companies have to, you know, shut down their physical buildings and they have to, you know, stop uh, using their fixed assets because everything has to be moved to the online business. But some companies actually take extra efforts by deploying all these resources to other alternative better usage and such way that it actually encouraged the innovativeness from the uh, employees within the company. And some companies even adjust their production such that they can produce the medical supplies such as test kits, ventilators, and the masks. Okay, so this build up the better network with new suppliers and then the societal at white has also benefited from a more innovative culture. Okay, so I want to give you two examples of the efforts that have been seen in the local uh, scenery. The first one is this movement of company of good. It's not a new concept, okay? It's basically started with the MVPC and many Singapore companies have self-registered into this uh, movement. So the company of good is basically recognized for all the good CSR activities they were engaging in. And uh, we at the business school has also worked with some of these good companies and uh, have written uh, plenty of, uh, you know, recent case studies on the efforts that they are making to contribute back to the society. And the other movement is this called uh, giving.sg. Okay, it is basically a government set up kind of a portal to allow all the organizations who need to raise funding, who need volunteers to post their requests here and any one of us could log in and try to contribute either in cash or in terms of volunteering hours. So such an open platform will allow all the citizens and all the organizations to participate voluntarily in building a better city and a better country. So with that, I'm going to come to the conclusion of my today's talk. What I have discussed so far is to basically tell you a lot of empirical evidence that have demonstrated that the crisis are not going to stop companies from uh, prospering. And especially for those companies who are doing very well in CSR, they seem to continue to do well in the longer time horizon. And even though at this current time period, we see a lot of uh, challenges for the company to stay afloat but it is also presenting a lot of good opportunities for the companies to step up in their efforts and activities. And they can think about the innovative ways to um, contribute to the internal social capital and external as well as the societal social capital. And the companies need to have a very clear and deliberate plan and actions when they are doing this, such that all the impacts could be properly evaluated and then the company can continue to survive in the long run. Then what would be the role of the public and the government agencies? They can also come in and we can also come in, you know, to appraise, you know, these companies for doing good 
and also to give them possibly more business and uh, contracts for these companies to continue to do well. Okay, so with that, I come to the end of my sharing today. Okay, and now I'm going to move over to the time of uh, Q and A's. Okay, so I have seen a lot of questions being posted in the chat group. Okay, let me just uh, see what is the first question. How do you measure social capital? I believe High Flux has good uh, social capital. Uh, why did she fail? Okay, all right. So I think that uh, just now I give you a little bit of uh, illustration how the social capital can be measured within the firm, uh, outside of the firm and at the societal level. And if you see those uh, definitions, you can see that they are probably very qualitative, okay? So usually in the past that people just use the CSR uh, given the rating and to represent the level of social capital. But what I'm sharing today is that that is not sufficient because the CSR and the, the social capital are not one-to-one -one mapped. When you do one thing, it can actually have the impact at the different levels of social capital. So the measurement is a big challenge even for the researchers, but I think that today I'm sharing mainly with you the ideas that we can rethink about, you know, the corporate social responsibility and its role that can impact on the sustainable economy in the long run. So if you are looking at the high flux, this particular company, because I personally have written, you know, the uh, uh, a case study on high flux, it has already been published. So we find that for high flux, the social capital side, yes, it has a good will, it has a lot of trust and confidence. But the main issue that we see with the high flux is due to its financial uh, activities. Okay, so just now I mentioned that in order for the company to do well, for a society to be sustainable, you have to take care of five different types of capital. So therefore, I think that uh, looking into the high flux case, we also have to bear in mind with, uh, you know, the financial aspect of the decisions that the companies are making, because it will also have, uh, you know, pretty big impact on the bottom line and the long term sustainability of the business. Okay, so I hope that I'm able to address uh, your question uh, sufficiently. Okay, now let me move on to the next question. Okay, so do you think CSR are more important for big companies, MNCs, and for small medium enterprise survival is the priority under COVID-19? All right, so I hope that, you know, from the sharing that I have given you so far, all right, the CSR is not only pertaining to the big corporations. Actually, under the company of good activities, there are a lot of SMEs are very active participants in such uh, CSR efforts. And they do see the benefits have been ripping from the, the genuine good efforts they are making. So personally, I, can, I have been working with a few SMEs. One is uh, Sensory and the other one is uh, Green Pack, Singapore Green Pack. And the, the third company, the SMEs that I have worked with um, is basically uh, food services and uh, food bank, okay? So through the interaction with their CEOs and their employees, we find that the people on the ground are actually very motivated to work for the company when they know that their company are also doing good uh, to the society. And we find that the employees are generally uh, very happy to participate. And when they see that the company is really setting aside a very clear uh, CSR policies for them to volunteer, for them to donate, they all happily contribute. And that lead to a higher retention ratio of the employees. And also it boosts the morality of the employees. So I think, okay, that many firms could consider to adopt this kind of a new mentality, okay? So CSR is no longer a bottom line activity. It can be carefully planned and designed such that it will benefit your profits as well through the interaction with various stakeholders. 
I think that is the important message that I'm trying to share with you today. Of course, it will still take many, you know, additional research efforts and years to prove that, you know, what is the best model to implement. But I don't think there will be a best model for all the firms out there. So therefore, we need to continue to provide some of the convincing evidence for firms at the different sectors, what would be the best way to engage in CSR such that it will also benefit their bottom line. Okay, so I have uh, another question here. Uh, on the five capital, which one is more important? Okay, so this framework has actually been proposed since 1987 and over the years, uh, basically we have seen it almost like 30 over years. The concept is not going away. Actually, people started to ask more and more questions about the importance of these five types of capital. Okay, so from the firm perspective, you may not have to tap into all these uh, five capitals, uh, you know, accumulation because it will be basically very difficult. But as a society at large, for example, Singapore, right, you do have to consider that how we are going to stay competitive and ahead in the next, you know, 50 years to come, because Singapore has very limited natural capital. Okay, we all agree with that. And we also know that we need to continue to build the financial capital because this crisis have taught us a very valuable lesson. If you don't have uh, the prudence in saving and then you will not be able to come out with the, you know, enough supply when, you know, the companies and the household need the cash. And then in terms of uh, uh, produce the capital, right? Uh, essential services continue to operate because we are part of the very important global supply chain. So these kind of activities simply cannot be stopped. And therefore, you know, the people are taking risk when they are carrying on the critical element of the production activities. And then it comes to the human capital. I mean, we all know that the government is so concerned of upskilling our labor force. Right, so a lot of the st stimulus budget has actually been given to encourage SMEs to innovate, to upgrade, such that the workforce will continue to be relevant and competitive in this midst of the crisis, as well as after the crisis. Okay, so social capital should always be at heart, especially during this pandemic. You can see that Singapore has been demonstrating a very resilient economy with a strong social capital. People are trusting, you know, the various sectors to coordinate and to help one another, okay, to provide all the resources and uh, the, um, the time and the money to help one another to live through this difficult time. So I think that these aspects cannot be ignored and it actually has to be even strengthened going forward. And just a few days ago, our minister has also mentioned that Singapore has to continue it to build up all this intangible capital and Singapore will continue to try to stay open and connected with the rest of the world. So the social capital that is accumulated through all these activities will also enable Singapore to win the trust and the confidence from the external investors and other countries to continue to have the trade and uh, you know, other kind of uh, social interactions. So I think that this will lead to you know, the end of my sharing today. And if you, are, you know, still want to discuss more, you can always you know, feel free to send me the emails and uh, I will be happy to answer your questions, okay? So now let's come to the end of today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much for staying with us, okay? And uh, this is uh, actually today is the last uh, series of this uh, webinar uh, talks on navigating the new normal. So we are really uh, happy that you have tuned in and uh, listened to our sharing. And for all the previous series, you can find it in the Facebook uh, online videos. So please continue to stay in tune with us and uh, keep on uh, looking at all the new updates that we may have going forward. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.